This podcast is for mature audiences. It contains graphic violence and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. Realm presents Blood and Gold, starring Richard Cabral. Episode 10. 1851, San Jose, California. Northern expansion marches on. The Denny Party lands at Alki Point and founds the city of Seattle. It becomes the northwesternmost city in the United States. Between robberies, I made two more trips to San Jose. I couldn't get Antonia Molinera off my mind. I went to the bakery, spoke with her parents, and visited with her. But so far, she had declined all my requests to do so much as to walk with me in the plaza. This time, I returned to the bakery determined to change that. I visited the tailor first and again wore brand new clothing with a new hat and shiny new boots. I purchased flowers from a street vendor and carried them in my left hand. I swept through the door determined to make an entrance she would remember. No one was at the front. For a moment, I thought the place was empty, but I inhaled the aroma of fresh baked breads and sweet treats, and I knew somebody must be here. Hello, Antonia. Antonia's father, Diego Molinera, emerged from the back room, clapping his hands amid a cloud of flour. Oh, it's you. Are you alone today? For now, my wife will be back shortly. And Antonia? The baker noted the flowers clutched in my fist and offered a smile. She's out today. Those are for her. They were. Leave them with me. I'll tell my wife you brought them for her. It's good politics. Molinera winked when he said this, and I set the flowers down on the counter. Please, put them in water. I will. I just don't want to handle them with these dirty hands. Then the baker leaned forward, elbows on the counter, and lowered his voice. Let me tell you something, son. Antonia likes you, but she's a grown woman, and you come at her like a little boy. Every time you come to the shop, you spend as much as a regular customer do in a month, and you speak with her and with her mother and me. But that's not what she wants. She wants a man who will sweep her off her feet. She feels like you're a little bit afraid of her. Afraid of her? Does she know who I am? She knows what you are. So she wonders why a man who takes what he wants from others is so cautious with her. Do you know where I can find her today? Today? No. But I know where she'll be tonight. Even from blocks away, the Fandango on 2nd Street was loud. Raucous music punctuated by the stomping of feet on the floorboards. As I drew nearer, I heard laughter as well, and voices singing and shouting. Closer still, I started to see human detritus, drunken men sitting on the side of the dark road, or stumbling along arm in arm cursing or telling crude jokes in slurred voices. On the side street or up the alleys, lovers who couldn't wait to get home tangled. None of them paid any mind to me as I rode up the street on my own horse, leading the second. The other horse was the best I'd been able to purchase that day, and it sported the finest Mexican tack and saddle. Side saddle because that's how Molinera had told me Antonia was most comfortable. Given what she was probably wearing for the Fandango, it was also the most sensible. She wouldn't be going home to change. A tarima had been raised across 2nd Street, taking up most of the block, with at least 100 people dancing and half again as many on the sidelines, watching, drinking, talking, or resting. The Fandango was a celebration of the end of summer and the coming of autumn, and there was a distinct chill in the air. 
this close. The racket was almost deafening, and the odors of roasting peppers and tortillas, tobacco smoke, sweat, and liquor battled for dominance. I stayed on my horse so I could see over the crowd. Finally, I spotted Antonia, wearing a white dress with red trim and lace, and white and red ribbons in her hair. She was dancing with the handsome, blonde-haired American man. She laughed as he drew her close to him, and I had to suppress an urge to draw a pistol and shoot him on the spot. But then, another man came up to her. This one, a Mexicano. Antonia turned away from the first one with a giggle and danced with the new man, just as flirtatiously. I was glad to see it. It meant the first man wasn't a lover, but simply another man who couldn't resist her charms. I had that in common with him, if little else. After, she started to dance with the third. I handed my reins to a young boy idling on the edge of the crowd and gave him a couple of coins to hold them for a few minutes. Then I wove my way through the dancers, smiling and excusing myself when necessary until I reached Antonia. I reached for her shoulder, but as my hand touched her, she was already turning around. Her face registered something between the light and surprise. I had to shout to be heard over the racket. It looks like you're having fun. Así es, me estoy divirtiendo mucho. I love to dance. I like watching you dance. But it's time to go. Go? Go where? With me? What are you talking about? I took her hand and drew her across the platform toward where I left the horses. She didn't resist, but I saw puzzlement on her pretty face. I almost lost her once when a man grabbed her and tried to start dancing with her, but I gave him a look that shrank him in his boots and he released her. Then we broke free of the crowd and I showed her the horses. Our mounts, I heard you prefer side saddle. From who? Wait, let me guess. My parents. Your father, let me help you up. She studied me briefly, bemused, then shook her head and put a foot in one stirrup. I hoisted her up, accidentally <sighs> cupping her behind as I did. She didn't object. When she was positioned, she tugged her skirts out from under her and sat on the horse like a true equestrian. It's a lovely saddle. The best money can buy. In San Jose, at least. I should have some boots, though. She kicked her feet in the air, still wearing her dancing shoes. In the saddlebags, along with everything else you'll need. My father helped you pack. He did. I found her riding boots, handed them over, and tucked away the other shoes. Are we riding far? A couple of days. When will we leave? I checked to make sure she was still ready for a long ride. That dress wasn't the most practical thing, but she could change it in a few hours. Satisfied, I climbed onto my own horse and turned it away from the ongoing festivities. Right now. Now? I smiled at her over my shoulder and started at a walk. Keep up. She gave the horse her heels and followed. So we're riding at night, out of town. We are. We'll stop and sleep in a while, but I want to put some distance between us and San Jose before we do. Old habits die hard. I don't think I want to know what that means. But what about bandits in the hills outside of town? I'm not sure you know who I am. You told me. You're Joaquin Murieta? But what does that mean? It means the only bandits we have to worry about work for me. <sighs> You're that Joaquin? It was the first time she truly sounded surprised by anything I said. I am. I thought you knew. I figured you were some kind of criminal. A smuggler, maybe, or a horse thief. I never imagined you were the bandit leader everyone talks about. Yes, but it's safer that way, isn't it? When I want people to fear me, 
I let them know who I am. And when I want to be left alone, I keep my own counsel. Not everyone fears you. The Americans do. Our people mostly admire you. Or they laugh up the stories about you anyway, without knowing which ones are true. Probably only the worst ones. So you want me to fear you too? Not you. I want you to love me as I do you. Love you? I hardly know you. You said that the first time we met. You know me better now, and soon you'll know me much better still. You hardly know me, and you think you love me. I know I do. I can't stop thinking about you, day and night. It's terrible. And being around me day and night will be better? I believe it will. I'm not sure you know who I am. We reached the edge of San Jose, and beyond was only open country, silvery in the moonlight. If you think I'm some kind of innocent young thing... Innocent? Hardly. Well, I'm not sure how to take that. But you should know about me, now that you've told me about you. Before they opened the bakery in San Jose, my familia was poor. As a young girl, I... I earned money to help, the way only a young girl can. Now the bakery's successful enough, and I haven't had to do that for a few years. I don't miss it, but I don't regret doing what had to be done. I hadn't expected anything like that in her background. She was nothing like the prostitutes I had known in the gold camps. They were hard, cruel women. I sensed some steel in Antonia, too. Perhaps those earlier experiences had put it there. But I didn't believe she thrived on meanness the way those other women had. She would need some steel to live at Arroyo de Cantua with me and my band. More than ever, I was sure I had made the right choice. I just hoped it wouldn't take too much time for her to agree. As I had promised, we stopped after a couple of hours near a creek that I knew about. When she began kissing me, I was anxious. I had only ever made love with Rosita. But Antonia had been with many men. She undressed me and then herself, her touch, her caresses of both my body and her own relaxed and aroused me at the same time. She knew some tricks La Rosa hadn't, slowed me down when I was too close to the edge and speeding me up when she wanted more until finally, spent, I lay gasping for breath in her arms. After a while, we bathed quickly in the cool water and slept for a couple of hours. With the sun, we rose and continued on our way. The sun was high, the day cloudless and warm, when I spotted a pair of men racing toward us down a grassy slope. Antonia saw them too and drew her mount closer to me. Is that bad? You wanted to see bandits. There they are. That's not what I said. Are they some of yours? I couldn't quite tell until they came closer, but I thought I recognized them. I believe so. In another minute, I heard them shouting my name. Now I could make them out. Juan Gallego and Humberto Mota. Both were relatively new to the gang and had ridden with other bandits before joining me. I halted my mount and Antonia, riding slightly ahead of me, circled back to stand beside me. Mota hailed me as they came to a stop. Joaquin, right before we spotted you, we saw a circuit judge I've seen before. He stays in hotels in every town and usually carries plenty of money. We were thinking about robbing him, but then saw you and thought you might want to join in. The men were gaping at Antonia, which reminded me of my manners. Men, this is Antonia Molinera. She's with me. These are Juan and Humberto, two of my men. Both men doffed their hats. Gallego just grinned. 
He was a happy sort, quiet and not too smart. Mota gave Antonia a slight bow from atop his horse. A pleasure, senorita. Can we catch this judge? He's not in any hurry. Let's ride then. With a laugh, Mota put the spurs to his mount and tore away. Gallego followed on his heels. I caught Antonia's eye, touched two fingers to the brim of my hat, and took off after them. Antonia stayed close behind. Within minutes, we saw the judge crossing a shallow valley at a steady trot and starting up a low hill on the other side. We raced across the valley, and by the time he had crested the hill, we were already climbing it. The rise dropped into a wide valley, flat and dry for mile after mile, with purple mountains hemming into the far side. The judge glanced back when he heard the hoofbeats behind him. Seeing us, he picked up his pace. As we hurtled down the hill toward him, the judge drew a pistol. He was no marksman, and trying to ride while shooting over his shoulder meant he did neither well. His shots flew toward the clouds, into the earth, or while wide of the marks. Mota pulled out a pistol. I shouted to him to put it away. Watch this! I took a lariat from its place on my saddle and started spinning it perpendicular to the ground. Slow, lazy spins at first to draw out the loop. Then I spurt the horse, and as I gained on the judge, I brought the lasso over my head. A few faster spins gave it the speed and velocity I wanted, and I let it fly. The rope soared over the judge, then dropped down around him. Once it had encircled his arms and torso, I brought my mount to a sudden stop and yanked on the rope, catching the loop tight around the judge. His horse kept going, which caused it to run right out from under its rider, dropping the judge unceremoniously to the dirt. His gun landed a safe distance away. His arms pinned by the lasso, he sat and waited, scowling while the four of us circled him. I dismounted. I hear you're a judge. I am indeed. I am Samuel Loudon, Esquire, an officer of the court and not to be treated in such a shabby manner. I doffed my hat and bowed deeply. I apologize. I thought it the best way to stop you before you hurt yourself and to disarm you before you hurt one of us. I am Joaquin Murrieta. And this, sir, is a robbery. The judge had lost his hat in the chase and his white hair stood in patches. His black clothes were covered in dust and a stray bit of cactus had landed in his beard. His brow was knitted his glare, furious. You can't rob a judge. Ah, <laughs> well, you might be surprised. All manner of people can be robbed, from the most dignified to the most churlish. You are no gentleman. Perhaps not, but neither am I the one sitting on my behind in the dirt. <laughs> my men laughed at that, and Antonia joined in. The judge seemed not to have noticed her before. And you, a woman? How can you join in such an nefarious act? It wasn't hard. Even a little girl could do it, if she could ride. The judge harumped at her. You are carrying money, correct? Humberto, check his horse. Juan and Antonia undress him. Check his clothing and any place on a person where a man might conceal something. Any place? Any place at all. Judge Loudon kicked his feet and tried to rise. It's in my bags. Antonia might check you anyway, just to be sure. All right, and in the pockets of my frock coat. And in some in my hat band. Juan, fetch his hat. Sir, Antonia will check your pockets. If you cooperate, she'll leave her clothing on. If you don't, she'll strip you to the skin. That could be a pleasurable experience, to be sure. But if you prefer to avoid it, I suggest you not to resist. Take it, take it all. Ah, oh, we wouldn't dare. How would you find lodging tonight? You might be in need of a drink or two as well. Although I suspect 
that your tale of being robbed by the famous bandit, Joaquin, might ensure you don't have to pay for your own drinks for some time to come. You're planning to let me live then? Of course! I remove my hat and crouch beside him. Take a good look at my face, Judge Loudon, and remember my name, Joaquin Murrieta. If I, or any man who swears allegiance to me, should ever appear before you in court, I trust that you'll show that man the same mercy I showed you here today. If I hear that you didn't, then I'll have to find you again and have a different kind of conversation. Is my meaning clear? Clear as day, outlaw. You mean not only to humiliate me and to rob me, but to make me violate my oath to do impartial justice. Say it any way you like, Judge. Just don't forget it. I hope we never meet again. But if we do, you won't enjoy the reunion. At the threat, the judge stopped arguing and cooperated fully. As promised, I allowed him to keep enough of his money to find lodging for the night. Finally, we removed the rope, unloaded his gun, but gave it back to him, along with his hat. We even caught his horse for him. As he rode off, Antonia broke into gales of laughter. What is it, querida? What do you find so funny? It's just, it's just, you never told me how much fun robbery is. Why didn't you tell me? I suppose I didn't know you would want to know. I wanted to protect you. Protect me? Joaquin, cariño. I think I'm the one who needs to protect you. She took me in her arms and kissed me. I felt the eyes of the other men on us, and I realized I didn't care. Rosita was never meant to be an outlaw's woman I knew. But Antonia had been born for the role. Life at Arroyo de Cantua wasn't all planning for robberies. The men held dances and contests, primarily involving shootings, riding and drinking, sometimes all at once, and sang songs, told stories of home, laughed and wept, and plotted revenge, large and small. But at Antonia's suggestion, I planned a real party for Christmas. I sent a couple of men to San Luis Obispo with orders to bring back two wagons of women and several barrels of tequila and wine. Antonia told them which houses to go to and who to speak to there to ensure a good selection of ladies. On Christmas Eve, everyone who owned a musical instrument brought it out. They all played together, mostly poorly, but with enthusiasm and a huge fire was lit to ward off winter's chill. If I felt the cold at all, it disappeared when I saw what Antonia had chosen to wear. A white, ruffled blouse, cut low and straight across the bust, and a brown skirt slit to the hip on one side. She gave me a sultry smile. I've never seen you in those before. I saved them for special occasions. I'm glad you approve. How could I not? At one point during the festivities, Antonia got up and performed a slow, sensuous dance. The imported prostitutes whooped and cheered her on. I could hardly wait for the party to end so I could take her back to the enclosed room of the ramshackle house and make love until dawn. Then, Gregorio Lopez approached me with a serious look on his face. What is it, brother? Huerta's here, with the man from the newspaper. Word had reached me that the editor of the El Dorado Republican wanted to meet me. I had dispatched one of my men to bring him here, 
taking all necessary precautions, of course. Now? I told them to come tomorrow. Well, they're here now. I can tell them to wait. No. The man's a guest. I'll talk to him. Take me there. Lopez led me to the wagon, stopped near the two that had brought the women. A couple of my men were already tending to the mules that had brought it. Frothy with sweat and thirsty from the long journey, Felipa Huerta helped another man. His head enveloped in burlap, climb awkwardly down from the wagon's bed. Take that thing off his head. Huerta drew a knife from a scabbard and sliced through the rope, holding the burlap fast. He whisked it off the man's head, dislodging his spectacles. The man caught them, repositioned them on his face, and looked around with a bewildered expression. He was still disoriented from the ride and trying to get his bearings. I stepped forward and offered my hand. I am Joaquin Murrieta. Oh, oh good. I'm Thomas Springer of the El Dorado Republican. I know who you are, Mr. Springer. Welcome to our camp. Springer's eyes twitched back over to Lopez. You two gentlemen. I know. We could be brothers. Not long ago, I was in Volcano, and a man stuck a gun in my belly, demanding the money I owed him. I had never seen him in my life, and I told him so. We spent a few tense moments together before I convinced him that I was not my friend Gregory here, the one who really owed him the money. Of course. I killed him for his insult to Joaquin, Lopez added. So I didn't have to pay him after all. Springer glanced back at the wagon, as if wishing he was racing in the other direction. I threw an arm around his shoulders. You came on an auspicious night, my friend. I can hear the festivities. Your Christmas celebration. That, and celebrating the joy of being alive and free. La Molinera, my woman, wanted a party. So I gave her one. Your woman? According to the rumors I've heard, your woman was... Uh... He let the sentence trail off, as if sorry he had even brought it up. With my arms still draped around the man's shoulders, I walked him toward the party. My Rosita was murdered in the foulest manner imaginable. I was destroyed, but she would have wanted me to keep living and to truly live. One must love. What about you, my friend? You have a woman. The American was scrawny, pale, bespectacled, with a narrow, pinched face. But I've seen uglier men who still had women to love them. No, I, I mean, I, I did, back in Ohio, but... Ohio? And she broke your heart? This woman? Something like that. Yes. We have women here tonight who will never break your heart. Other parts of your body, maybe, but only by wearing them out. Feel free to indulge yourself. As for drink, it's tequila to your liking. It was a long trip. Some water, possibly. Water we have. Gregorio, fetch water for my new friend. Come, Thomas Springer. Let me show you how outlaws live. Springer's eyes bulged as he took in the raucous scene. A huge, roaring bonfire. Music being played badly, but loud. Men and women dancing and kissing and more. Some making love right out in the open. Liquor everywhere. People smoking, laughing, naked women dealing cards. It was apparently not what he had expected. And neither, I suspect, was I. By reputation, I was a bloodthirsty ruffian, a ruthless thug. Rumors abounded of my wife's grisly demise, my brother's hanging. But just as many people swore I didn't exist at all, that I was some kind of composite of many Mexican bandits, no one man could be in so many places at once, could rob or kill so many people. 
Yet, here I was, in the flesh, attempting to be as courteous and friendly as possible. Tell me, Mr. Springer, why did you ask to meet me? I want to interview you for the newspaper, but I'm nothing important. Not some politician or, or wealthy landowner. I'm a simple man. But you admit, you're an outlaw. Oh, yes. Why well, try to hide that? Everybody seems to know already. Wow, if everyone knows about you, then you're important. But I don't think they do know. Not really. The, they think they know. There are so many stories about you. I want to find out which are true, which are made up. The made up ones are probably more exciting. I only print the truth, or as much of the truth as I could find out. And I thought, who would know the truth about Joaquin better than the man himself? Thank you for agreeing to see me. I've read some of your articles. You don't like me very much. Springer swallowed hard, but didn't deny it. You prey on innocent people. I prey on people who've preyed on others. The wealthy who take most of what the workers earn. And I give to the poor, especially to the poor Mexicans, who are the most downtrodden of all Californians. I won't argue that. He seemed hesitant to push too far, lest he incur my wrath. None of us is truly innocent. That is, after all, the Bible's first lesson, isn't it? You're right. My men and I are bandits. We still. Sometimes we kill, but we also have rules. Things we will not do. Those aren't always the things your laws prohibit, but the things my personal code prohibits. We will not steal from the poor. We will not take women against their will. We don't steal from the church. All honorable positions, I suppose. My men parted before us as we passed through the crowd. The din was louder here, the heat from the bonfire almost unbearable. Springer eyed the bevy of crude habitations erected around the fire in no discernible order. Near my house, a flagpole flew the green, white, and red Mexican flag. This did not escape the journalist's notice. Welcome to Mexico. The wagon ride was only two days long. And your man wasn't racing his mules? Surely we're still in California. I swept an arm, indicating the rocky heights surrounding us. Within these walls, it's Mexico. A territory, if you will. Soon to be larger still. I led him to a spot where cane bottom wooden chairs had been set upon the grass. Antonia sat in one of them, looking even more stunningly attractive than ever. Judging from Springer's expression, her appeal was not lost on him. I smiled, happy to show off my woman. Come, sit with me and La Molinera. We can speak freely there. If you have other obligations, we can talk tomorrow. If it's all right for me to stay the night, that is. Of course. We've set up a special tent for you. Look around. If you see a woman who you'd like to have join you there, just point her out. Thank you, but, but no, um, if we can talk more tomorrow, I have many questions to ask. More up to you. Gregorio, show Mr. Springer to his tent and make sure he has anything he needs, except perhaps for quiet. That, I'm afraid, will be hard to come by tonight. Lopez hurried to carry out my orders, but before he could, I grabbed Springer's arm in a stilly grip. Two things, you always misspell my name. It's M-U-R-R-I-E-T-A. One T? Correct. Noted. And the other thing? You must never 
tell anyone that you came here or that you met me. Swear it. But the perceived veracity of an interview depends upon the reader's certainty that the writer actually questioned the subject, face to face as it were. It's for your safety as well as my own. Either swear it or be buried here. The choice is yours. Really, it was no choice at all. Springer swore. You're listening to Blood and Gold, starring Richard Cabral. Blood and Gold is a Realm production in association with Stryker Entertainment. Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Blood and Gold stars Richard Cabral, based on the novel Blood and Gold, The Legend of Joaquin Murieta, by Jeffrey J. Marriott and Peter Murieta, Produced by Marco Palmieri, Fred Greenhalge, Kaylin West, and Haley Wagreich. Adapted for audio by Greg Cox. Directed by Fred Greenhalge. Executive produced by Molly Barton, Marcy Wiseman, Russell Binder, Peter Murieta, Julian Yap, and Richard Cabral. Historical notes read by Elena Ray. Spanish dialogue translated by Alana Grafham. Regional Dialect Coaching by Luis Armando Mercado Campos. Sound Design by Eric Mooney. Mixing, Mastering, and Additional Sound Design by Rory O'Shea. Audio Editing by Corey Barton. Original Score by Juan Carlos Enriquez. Music Supervision by Marcus Begala. Production Manager, Alexis Latshaw. Production Coordinator, Angela Yee. Casting by Sunday Bowling and Meg Mormon. Cover Art by Kendall Thomas. Executive in charge for Realm, Mary S. Adolahi. Find more shows like Blood and Gold by following Realm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at realm.fm. <laughs>